Hello, wonderful slumber party listeners. It's your host, Tim Murray. And today we have a very special crossover episode of not only Slumber Party, but also our Patreon podcast, What to Watch, where we talk about what to watch, what to listen to, what to read, and what to do during this time when we're all sitting at home alone. And I discovered a book in the last month that I think is really special and very, very worth your time. So today I have the author of A Gay Man's Guide to Life, Get Real, Stand Tall, and Take Your Place. Please welcome to the stage, Britt East. Hi, Thank Britt. You. How are you? I'm doing great. It's so good to be here with you. I'm so, I'm so glad. I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm so glad to see a gay person. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I never thought, I'm like extremely an introvert and I didn't think I would miss like seeing people, but he, here we are. <laughs> you know, I'm the same way. I'm kind of a hermit and uh, I'm married and my husband's kind of introverted as well. And we kind of were like, how is this going to go? And he realized pretty quickly that he missed what he likes to call the theater of experience. Ooh. Talk, talk more on that. The theater yeah. of experience. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, he's a big people watcher. We're really involved in the local arts community up in Seattle and we just miss being out and about. I mean, as much as I love to spend time in solitude with my own thoughts and, you know, we miss that exposure to being stimulated by other artists and and people and uh, like you said it's like oh my god another gay person quick you know <laughs> it's been so we went long to, we've been all cooped up my boyfriend and i went to the grocery store the other day and i literally whispered to him gay people because <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy it's like you know you, you think oh i don't you know especially being coupled up in this way you're like i don't need to go to gay bars i don't really I don't need that life, but um, no, I, I need it. I need to just like talk to gay people about what music they're listening to and what who they're liking on Drag Race or just whatever it is that's that's coming up. It's like, oh, right, I, I miss this shorthand that I've had with people. Well, we're so saturated in straight culture, obviously. We live in the land of straight supremacy, so we're just saturated in it. And like you said, you just get hungry for it when you can't go to your spaces. Yeah, yeah. And I love what you said about uh, your husband being a people watcher. I'm watching Fran Lebowitz's uh, oh, Netflix. I love that you, show. You <laughs> it's so great. I love that show. <laughs> what she says about, uh, she doesn't have a phone. And so she's living in New York City and she's like, I get, I, for my whole life, I've been getting on the subway and just looking at people. Yeah. And I just absorb what they're doing. I lived in New York yeah. for seven years and I'm like, fuck, I must have missed so much on my phone or reading a book on the subway when I could have just been, you know, it's so easy to get like, oh, get these people away from me. There's too many people everywhere. But yeah, now I'm like, I would kill to just watch yeah, what somebody's funny. doing on so the subway. Funny. It's so funny. It's so true. So your book, how, when did this idea to write this book come to you? Like how long ago? 20 years. Damn. <laughs> I know. So, you know, I've been putting it off and putting it off. Everybody's like, you know, you got to tell your story. It's so incredible. And so, and I just felt not right. It felt icky. It felt like I was kind of prostituting my pain, like just trying to expose myself and bleed all over the page and make a few bucks. And I just left a bad taste in my mouth. But I was working with a life coach a couple of years ago who was helped me flip the script and realize that if I put the reader at the center of the story instead of me and my pain and trauma and, and past and all that, then I could make them the hero. And I could feel, I could weave in my story, but make it less about monetizing a memoir and more about celebrating the reader and their possibilities. I love that. I think that's exactly how it comes across. And I really hope you know, I do not mean this as a joke. This is very serious. I also recently read Jessica Simpson's autobiography. <laughs> I promise, Britt, this has- Okay, this is over. <laughs> this Zoom, okay. <laughs> I swear, everybody has this reaction. I'm not comparing your book to hers, but 
I, okay, I sort of am. She, she says in the book a, a similar thing. She was like, everybody wanted me to write a book about how I, about how my life is great right now, right? Like, uh, I, she's a billionaire. She has a husband. She has kids. Everything on paper. She was like, I was gonna write like a self help book, basically. And she said a similar thing where in the book where she was like, I wanted to be a little more uh, raw and a little more like this is these are the struggles I go through in my life. And I hope, and I really think, I really mean this, her book is very universal. She was an alcoholic and also like struggled with her weight. And she's also a gay icon. You're laughing, but I, I promise. <laughs> I'm not laughing, I'm dying. Tim, I'm never gonna forgive you for this. You're going on the shit list. I have a little sheet of paper over here with your name on it and circled and underlined. That's t that's completely fair. That's completely fair. But I think there is really something to what you're saying about, I think especially as gay people, we have so much shame wrapped up in our lives that it's hard not to think like, yeah, am I putting myself too much on display? And I think your book does such a fabulous job of being so relatable and giving us a true guide that isn't necessarily like make or break, right? Like I really felt like, okay, there are so much, so many elements of this that I can apply to my life. And so much of this is searing pain that I have forgotten about. And, mm -hmm. and yet it's still like a welcoming thing to read, even though it's deeply painful. Uh, like I will, I wrote a couple of quotes down that I was really, really moved by. Um, when you said I retreated into an entitlement rage and I was surrounded by boys, so many boys. <laughs> I mean, especially as gay white men, I think the piece about entitlement is so deeply true and so hard not to, it, it's hard not to beat ourselves up for and I don't know. Can you can you speak a little to that that piece? Yeah, it's it's a very humbling experience, isn't it? Um, as white people, especially gay cis white men, it's like we're walking on ice right now. All sorts of stuff has been exposed to us that was always there that we chose not to see, that we were conditioned not to see and we're now being forced to confront it. And we almost don't know which way is up. And so it's really easy to retreat into entitlement rather than sit with the fear, the embarrassment, the desolation of all that we have helped um, destroy and bring forth um, in this world. That is a lot for anybody to carry. And yet it is, our duty to carry it. it is our duty to sing these songs and to and to have these conversations it is white work to dismantle um, the systems that propagate racism it is male work to dismantle the systems that perpetuate homophobia uh, misogyny and it is gay work to raise awareness around homophobia so we're just surrounded by work and it's it's not fun, it's scary, it's embarrassing, it's humbling, it's all of that. And so that's why we just kind of, you know, to be an American right now is just to kind of trundle through life, wondering who I'm supposed to hate and who probably hates me and figuring out how to harness and channel my outrage. Yeah, that is, yeah, I think you just hit the nail on the head. And I think another thing that really jumped out to me about the book is, and this is maybe messed up of me, but you know, we've got a lot of issues, all of us that we're, that we're daily working through. Ever since I read The Velvet Rage, mm -hmm. I, when I meet a gay man specifically, I almost immediately think to myself, you have read it or you haven't read it, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is, you know, I shouldn't be comparing myself to other people or judging other people in that way. But, you know, sometimes when you meet somebody who is like really very clearly 
deep in their self-hatred and you recognize that in them because it's a mirror of yourself of what you've experienced it's hard not to think that and while I love 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 that book and it truly changed my life I really appreciate that your book is one more of a guide for what to do not just stories about uh what has happened to others but also there's almost no mention of privilege in the velvet rage and i thought it was really important and really helpful that you thread that needle through uh a gay man's guide yeah and you know that was written in a different era and is so totally. classic of the white experience in this world because i suspect most of us were somewhat blind to it um, th through our privilege, ironically. And so it has been the exposure of all that we've endured over the last four years as white people that has revealed to us what others have been enduring for centuries and made it really come home. And so, I mean, it's, it's so easy to just try and move it to the side. And I think more than any other demographic, white gay cis men harbor a toxic misogyny and racism that has to be dealt with if we're ever truly to eradicate our epidemic of persistent loneliness. Mm, our epidemic of persistent loneliness. That is, I want to get that as a tattoo, to be honest. That's like, <laughs> so that's hits me really hard. And what you said about misogyny, I think, is hugely important. And I used to host this podcast with my co-host, uh, Peter Kim, who no longer does it with me, but we would talk about that a lot. And it was something we would try to challenge our gay male guests mm -hmm. on, especially because, and I, again, I wrote down some of these quotes that really hit me from your book. Stop expressing public disgust at female bodies was a huge, it, that's a huge one. I think that as a, as a comedy person, I want to really hammer this home for gay men, especially. It ain't funny. Like it's not, it's just not, it's basic. It's like the easiest, lowest hanging fruit for you to take this traumatic piece of yourself that was like, oh, I always was bullied for not being attracted to women and just flipping that and making it that you are completely disgusted. I understand it. Like we want to take the power back from what mm -hmm. was taken from us, but we as a culture of gay people have to get over that because I think the way you expounded on that was brilliant and real that that really, that simple thing of saying like vaginas are gross or whatever it gold is. Star gay. Gold, the gold star gay thing, which is still super prevalent that was on drag race this past week that someone called themselves a gold that's star why gay. i brought it up <laughs> really yeah. yeah you watch you watch drag race i do yeah are you liking this season yeah i am you know my husband is the addict uh in the family but i definitely enjoy it and we've seen every every single episode of every single season um last season was epic and this season is really great too i'm definitely have my favorites and can't wait to see where it goes but you know they're like we all do they're saying this stuff they're processing working through it in real time i mean sure it's recorded and edited and stuff but like the rest of us they deserve the space and the grace for generosity and redemption and we all put our foot in our mouth so if you're somebody that said gold star gay last week or last year or something you still get to have your birthday it's just a matter of some self-reflection and cleaning up your behavior moving on maybe you even need to make some apologies maybe not but whatever the case you can change these little things today and they have a big impact does not replace the big work that needs to be done, but at least it's a tactical, easy starting point, something you can do today. Exactly. And I think I'm really glad you brought that up because it's not my intention or I think any of our intention to shame anybody right. for their behavior. And, it, and if you are out there saying like vaginas are gross, it's not my intention to make you feel bad. It's, and like you're saying, everybody deserves forgiveness and we can grant that to everyone. But if you're listening to this and you think like, yeah, I do that, then yeah, it's time to make that change. And yeah, yeah same for, sorry, go ahead. It starts with curiosity and empathy. And if you get mm. curious about your own behavior and its impact in your community and the larger world, 
and you start to you know think about and feel what it might be like to walk in someone else's shoes you can't help but raise your awareness and your consciousness and start to change your behavior and one person at a time that changes the whole equation yeah and i think that's what we're seeing hopefully seeing with the black lives matter movement and what i'm for those who are not jumping on board what i'm seeing a lot of them not doing is not considering and not reading and not taking in what it must feel like to be a black person in this country and what's and, so hard what's so hard for all of us is knowing where our deal breakers are and where our deal makers are for so long black bodies have been deal makers and 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 we as white people like to pretend that we're anti-racist when we're really um, just sort of opting out of the most egregious behavior. We think that we get a free pass because we've endured some bigotry, but we're so quick to discount all of our privilege. And as white cis gay men, we stand sort of near the top of the pecking order and have participated in um, you know the systemic bigotry of a lot of different people. And so there's awareness to be stoked. There's amends that need to be made, even living amends, but it's got to change. If not just morally, then pragmatically. For instance, most of our rights as gay people come from the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In fact, the Supreme Court decision that came down last year around Title IX and, and um, giving us redress when we experience employment discrimination based on our sexuality that was because of that civil rights law. So even if you can't get there morally, pragmatically, our rights are coming out of the black civil rights movement. So there's a lot of honor and respect that they are due. 100%. And I think there's so much to be said for how long they, by, by they, I mean, black people, the black community has had to fight to continue and we do sit on a, a mountain of privilege, not to take away from our struggle either, but it, this movement of, and again, we have a much further to go, but this movement of gay rights and gay respect that we've seen in the last 10 years moved very quickly. My life is different. In fact, there's, there's nothing like it in recorded human history. It is the How fastest crazy. amount of social change. And because of that, there's some unintended consequences that we are all experiencing where a huge segment of the population does not know which end is up. The world in which they grew up has been destroyed and they are just left hanging out there in the rubble. They are not with us yet. And we have to find the courage and the generosity to extend our spaces to those who would love us given half a chance. Not everybody will come with us, I'm not delusional but a lot of them could, a lot of them would if we, if we extended ourselves to them. And so we've got to find what are our deal breakers in terms of beliefs, expressions, behaviors in relation to other people and where can we make deals? And that's a personal journey that has to be lived every day. There's no answer in the back of the book on that one. There's no right or wrong. I mean, that's something that's deeply personal and has to be, we, we should all struggle with daily. Yeah. And to go back to the piece about the feminine, I want to read one more mm -hmm. quote at you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, you said in the book, I believe we can trace almost all of our internal hate back to the fear of the feminine. Will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I certainly did not originate this idea, but I, I believe in it, that somehow homophobia stems from misogyny, that we are so indoctrinated in this... Um, you know, male dominated culture for millennia, the, the culture of patriarchy and patrimony where a man and a woman get married to preserve their wealth, their land, their property, their income, to pass it down to their children. There's something primal in the limbic brain about that and its tendrils are all over the place. And I see so much of homophobia as a result of the violation of that patriarchy that some of us would stand apart. In many indigenous societies, there really was no homophobia. Obviously gay culture, if you could even call it that was profoundly different than we experience today, but homosexual, bisexual, pansexual people have always existed. 
since the beginning of time. It was really the, the uh, religious colonial um, doctrines that were brought through Manifest Destiny as, as Britain and the US started to take over the world where this stuff started to, to really be expressed. And for me, it's, it's about the subjugation of women. And so part of what we can do as gay people to resist that is to lift women up collectively so they can stand in their own power. And so like when we do things like comment on women's bodies, even what we think is positively, it, we, we need to understand it rarely raises their social standing. Usually on some level, even if we're praising them publicly, privately is totally different. If we're praising them publicly, it rarely raises their social standing. There's a reductionist aspect to where it takes power away from them. So that there's all sorts of little things we can do and big things we must do in order to lift up women so that we too can be lift up, not just because it's morally right, which it is, but also pragmatically, practically, so gay people can be more free. Mm, yeah. And I think, yeah, it's all related, right? Like it, it, if you exactly. are making a comment on a woman's body, like you said, publicly, whether it be positive or negative, you are casting judgment in some way, even if, even if it's like uh, uplifting, like you said, it that has such a ripple effect. And, and when you, if you were to refer to a woman's voice about the way a woman speaks, you know, the whole conversation yeah. about not never saying that a woman sounds shrill for obvious reasons I think all of that really contributes to everyone's narrative and everyone's hate and I remember I had a very effeminate voice as a young boy and I got bullied a lot by girls by by girls saying like oh you sound like a girl like and that conversation that we are continuing was contributing to their self-hate of like, they didn't want to see a man sound like a boy. Exactly. And I think that's what's so interesting about the drag movement that we're seeing right now, because there's something being compartmentalized about seeing a cis man in a wig. And I think why there is still transphobia, even in the gay community, there's something that feels, uh, right to a certain part of our demographic to see a gay man wearing a wig they have started to label it and understand it and they're now willing to support it but the idea of a trans woman doing drag is different to them because they haven't been exposed to it as much and furthermore still the idea of a gay man standing on stage, I'm going to talk specifically about my experience doing stand-up comedy, standing on stage without uh, a feminine illusion of a wig or eyelashes or breastplate or whatever it is, and having a quote-unquote faggy voice is deeply threatening to so many of us, I think, in our gay male circle, especially considering how many of us still uh, contribute to the idea of like mask for mask. Absolutely. Unless gay men learn to stand in their power, we inevitably allow ourselves to be subjugated by the media driven narratives about straight masculine men, quote unquote, and gay feminine men, quote unquote. And we, that plays out in so many different ways, like you articulated. If as soon as we meet another gay person, I think a lot of straight people would be surprised that we're not necessarily instantly open energetically. In fact, a lot of times we're shut down a little bit because we're nervous. Have we slept with them? Do we want to sleep with them? Um, you know, are they masculine? Are they feminine? Are they going to expose me? What setting am I in? Am I at the workplace? There's this all this undercurrent to these relationships, the relationships between gay and men and straight women, you know, that's become kind of a cliche over time because there's a thrilling component to it. A man and a woman can't be friends in straight culture. That's mm -hmm. how the, the cliche goes. But now all of a sudden, if he's gay, maybe we can be friends. But unless we address all this stuff 
underneath the surface of the water, you know, below that iceberg, there's going to be this dynamic of usury in, uh, in the relationship and where people go unseen and unknown. So what I try to do in this book is get to the heart of the matter. And because I'm a gay cis man, I wrote it through my lived experience. And so I tried to unpack some of the dynamics in this relationship and I'm pretty brutal on gay people, um, not so much as a beatdown, but more because as a, as a means to empathy so that they can understand why maybe they feel lonely and afraid in the, in the dark of night and the recesses of their minds. They can understand how they're constantly being inundated with the culture of straight supremacy, white supremacy, male supremacy, and it's an act of resistance meaning it's painful and, and has a cost to push back against that, whether it's with people of color, um, you know, women or, or straight men or whomever, or people at the intersections of these identities, whomever it is. It's an act of resistance to truly see one another. The media wants us to see our surfaces, to live in this state of bias and prejudice, and we resist by see, truly looking past that and engaging with one another on a human level. Yeah, I think, yeah, that I have like sort of a difficult conversation point that I want to delicately bring up, sure. but I think you're the right person to talk to about it. I think when I started doing stand up, I was living in deep fear, the fear that you're talking about, I think here of like, are people going to judge me and what are yeah. they going to think and what are they going to say? Mostly of straight men, which mm -hmm. you bring up in the book a lot, which is so valid because we live in a straight supremacy. And I dealt with a lot of really dumb, pretty predictable bullshit of going to like open mics in Los Angeles and just hearing like oh, a geez. fucking <laughs> a, a guy who is like deeply unfunny say something like, uh, I can deal with the LBT, but sorry, gay guys, I'm not there yet. Like, just like deeply bad, like stuff that's so bad that you're like, at least for me, I'm at a place where I'm like, this is traumatic for me, but also fuck off. Like, I'm not, that's not even close to being a good enough joke to <laughs> bother me. So there's that element. And then the reason why I think this guide is so helpful for me and hopefully anyone who reads it is the self-hate that becomes self like persecution of others. Exactly. The only two times I've been heckled, I did a tour before the world closed down on my stand-up show. And the only two times I was heckled were both by gay men. Is that something that you have grappled with? Is that, um, something that you have dealt with, I guess is my question. Yes, and I think it's something that all, that your entire audience will resonate with. I mean, I talk to dozens of gay men every day grappling with queer culture. And like, what does it mean? How do I fit in? Why is everybody so friggin' mean and <laughs> hostile and angry? And it's like you said, we have weaponized our rage and our shame we, it, we, we took it in and held it dear, and then we pushed it out and trying in this illusion of control and trying to feel powerful. And, and then we just spew it out onto the world so that maybe they will feel less than we feel. Obviously a misguided strategy on so many levels. And it's, and it's not going to bring more love in your life. It's just going to bring fear and shame and loneliness. It's by leaning into our own suffering and sitting with our own fear and pain and vulnerability that we manifest true strength and become who we really are. And when my, my advice when speaking with anybody struggling to make friends, struggling to find a date, struggling to find love, is to figure out who you are at the core, go be who you are out in the world, go find those places where you can be most uniquely yourself shine your light as bright as possible and follow the energy. You can do none of that 
if you're spewing out bile and hate and fear and self-loathing, if it's unprocessed. So for a lot of us, that means um, learning our history. That means reading self-help books. That means hiring talk therapists, subject matter experts, life coaches, whatever um, your strategy, you're going to need some benevolent witness who can join you in the moment and sit with you shoulder to shoulder in those experiences that you've endured so you can meet yourself in their eyes and watch them delight in your presence and then learn to love yourself and rewrite your story. That's how you, that's how you can step out of this weaponized shame, fear, and step into your own power, per, uh, purpose, and passion. And are you saying that as the person, how not to continue that narrative by persecuting others? Or, yes. oh, okay. And then, so what do you, and it's okay if we don't have the answer to this question, but what do we do in the immediate if someone is, say, I, like when I got heckled, or if someone says to me, um, you know, a, a gay friend recently said to me, uh, you should be more serious about your fitness. Like, why don't you work out more? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I don't have any idea how to respond to this. And I don't think that that's unique to me. I think a lot of gay yeah. men, like we're saying, fall into this. So that's how we stop yeah. ourselves from be, from continuing that narrative. Yeah. How do you have any advice for how we can react to that? Or uh, uh, is it having that benevolent witness, just like a friend or a therapist to say, no. hey, this happened to me and having them just recognize the hurt? Or is there anything else we can Oh yeah, there's tons of stuff you can do. It all depends upon the relationship, the level of re relatedness and trust that you enjoy with this person. If it's a complete stranger, they likely get the middle finger or you cross the street or you ignore them just depending on your mood, your state of being, that kind of stuff, right? I mean, you're not gonna get invested with the stranger on this stuff. If you are engaging in the energy of convincing others, you might as well go hang out on Facebook in the comment section for all the good it's gonna do you. Don't try to, resistance is not a matter of in that moment changing minds. You have to first protect yourself, use your boundaries to keep yourself safe physically and emotionally and maybe financially if this is happening at work or something like that. You have to gauge, you need to be in the reality of the relationship. And that takes a daily practice of self-reflection and so that's like where you're saying we're working with a subject matter expert can help you establish that daily practice or reading books like mine can help you figure out how to create that practice that will that will foster emotional resilience so you can take these slings and arrows that will come your way especially as an out gay man they will come your way you can take it all with a grain of salt and one day learn to laugh at it because you're so powerful standing in your vulnerability you will learn to laugh at it now, if this is coming from friends, that's a little bit different. If this is coming from friends and often a conversation needs to happen, like, fuck off, I work out when I want to. Maybe that's like a, this, you know, starting point of the conversation, depending on the nature of a relationship. Or maybe it's like, dude, when you say stuff like that, I, I feel kind of like, you know, sad because um, I want a relationship to be more about than about my physical appearance. Like, I don't want it to be transactional. I want it to be about spending time together and having fun and enjoying life. And when you say stuff like that, it's confusing and weird and I feel lonely and kind of sad and not go away. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you, you have to, you, you tune, you, you tune your boundaries to the reality of the relationship. But a lot of us in all honesty, don't have that capacity because we're just walking around half asleep. We're not, we're not, um, invested in our own health and well-being yet and and that's what my book tried to be it tries to be as a wake-up call to help people get real to stop living in the shallows and really get real about what's actually going on so that you can live a better life and stand in your power if this is so, a, something that's happening with your family then you can ratchet up the um, anger even further and really allow you know if it's a loved one a partner or you know, some member of your family that you're connected to, then they can afford your true anger and you can have a good old fashioned temper tantrum and let them have it and then get back and talk to the feelings about how you want the relationship to go in the future. But it's a whole spectrum and you just have to consider the reality of your relatedness. Whoa, yeah, that I have so many thoughts about so much of what you just said. 
Yeah, that I think the tough thing, I'm going to speak to my experience specifically and listeners, you can take this with a grain of salt for however you experience something like that. But I think the the struggle I have is the immediate rage, like the immediate rage that I didn't know I had in me. And I Mm -hmm. don't think many people would assume that about me. Like, like, uh, you know, I, I very much, I think, come off as like a, uh, very easygoing person, which I think can re- translate in some people's minds as like uh, not angry. <laughs> but I think many gay men, especially, have some of that anger in them. And yeah. when my friend said that to me, it was kind of like, okay, sh- like this is clearly about you and like whatever you are oh, needing. Lord. Yeah, like what, whatever it is that you need from the world, you're trying to project onto me. Like I've oh. been down that road of working out seven times a week and it made me deeply obsessive and unhappy. Uh, but it's, and it's none of their business. It's none of your business, yeah. <laughs> it's none of your business, but it still made me so mad, I think because of all the bullying and the unpacked trauma from growing up exactly that was the gift to you in that moment is now you have the choice of how can you respond we all have different responses to love we'll call that love writ large we all have different responses to any moment they were largely dictated to us by our family and our community we can't help that what we can do is is change our response over time. And that is our obligation to go ferret out what was underneath the issue like you just did so that you can feel more free and more authentic in the future. So you don't have to keep repeating that. And so if that happens to you and you have an undue emotional reaction, meaning it's out of proportion with the um, with a comment, like in that situation, I'll just play pop psychologist. In that situation, an appropriate comment would be like, Fuck off, I work off when I work out when I want to. And then you leave it at that, you go on about your day. But if it hits you, if it lands a little more deeply, like it sounds like it did, then you might get curious and empathetic with yourself and think, hmm, I wonder why I'm still angry about this a day later. I wonder why this hurts a little more than maybe it, than it otherwise should. And think, oh, okay, yeah, I, there's been times when I have been felt like inundated with messages about the way gay men should look. And oh yeah, hmm, there's been times when I thought maybe I'll never find a boyfriend because I don't look like this certain white gay that's sold to us on magazine covers or in fitness ads or whatever. And you might start to empathize with yourself like, oh yeah, I can see how that would be really scary and really lonely. Those messages really are out there. If it doesn't go away, then you might find that benevolent witness, a loved one, a friend, a paid professional to sit with you and you talk to them and you're like, you know, this really hurt. And I don't, I don't seem to be able to let go of it. I know it was just a stupid comment and that guy was just being a jerk. He didn't mean anything by it. He was just having a bad day, but I can't seem to let go of it. I wonder what's going on. And the emotional joining in that moment. And when you see the love for you expressed through their eyes, it might be enough to heal it. There might be something else deeper that requires even further investigation and inquiry. But the point is the process. If you're not part of that process, if you're not in the game on that, then you're just residing at the surface level and you're doomed to repeat these experiences over and over again. Mm, doom, yeah, doomed to repeat these experiences over and over again. I think it's key for me specifically because, uh, yeah, I, I have a hard time, which I think many people do, confronting people not even not even confronting just you know just saying yeah hey fuck you that hurt my feelings right but I think with this person in particular it's someone I've grown pretty close to and had recently had kind of what I felt like was a brave moment for me where I was like hey this isn't cool with me I just really want to communicate that to you and we had this very open conversation about it and then that conversation happened like pretty quickly afterwards and I think this that doesn't mean that he is a bad person or that anyone out there any of these traumatized gay people who are taking their trauma and weaponizing it none of them are bad people but I had uh Jessica Vosk on the podcast a few months ago who's this unbelievable Broadway performer yeah she said something so good she said something that struck me 
about the pandemic specifically and our relationships, she was like, I think this is a really good time to recognize. Yeah, it doesn't mean people are bad or good, but who is bringing value into your life and who isn't? And that's it's okay to separate yourself from people who aren't making you feel good. And you had a similar um, idea in, in the book about growing older and mm-hmm. how, yeah, you just have less time to be around people and that's okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And I think the way I like to think about this is it's all about choices and affordability. So for instance, I will I, I, I choose not to call people homophobes. I choose not to call people racist, I, uh, sexist, whatever. I choose, that's how I choose to label their actions. So I believe in homophobic choices, actions, words, behavior, not homophobic people. And what that does is it puts the onus on them to do better when they know better. And it creates space for redemption because I believe that is available to all of us. Like you said, your friend still gets to have his birthday. Christmas isn't canceled. It just means like you may not have been able to afford that relationship for a week. You might have needed a week off to process and think through things and simmer down, or or maybe you can't afford it for a year or maybe forever, depending on what the issue is. But it's not about casting. People are complex and they and we change over time. It's not about casting somebody as one thing or another. That's just more othering behavior. It's um, it's about owning the reality of their choices in that moment that they're doing the best that they can. And if the best that they can is that some dumbass comment slips out, well, then that may be like, well, I don't, I'm too old to walk with that this year or <laughs> I need a week <laughs> off. <dude. laughs> yeah. Yeah. 